Welcome to the Texas Oil and Gas Podcast, the show dedicated to bring you the news from the oil patch deep in the heart of Texas with your host, Ryan Ray and Josh Shelton. And we're back with the Texas Oil and Gas Podcast. This is episode 130, 130. Uh, you know, Ryan is, is out today. Uh, he's Last I talked to him, he was uh, getting some fishing lessons down in South Texas you know, last time we were out at Baffin Bay, he didn't know how to use the uh, what they call a bait cast. We call it an open face. So he's getting some some lessons on that. He was using the, you know the spin cast. Unfortunately, while he was out there, Nate, his uh, his ovaries flared up, so he had to he had to leave from the fishing lesson. So unfortunately, uh, he's not going to make much progress with his fishing skills. So anybody that's going to be joining him will unfortunately have to deal with um, subpar subpar fishing skills. So. Uh, I hate it for him. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe he can he can try again here in a couple of weeks. You know, Nate, it's kind of fun being here, just me and you. Yeah, all morning, no complaining, no mumbling. Um, yeah, maybe. Nothing but adults in the room. That's right. Yeah, if, if God knows he needs the fishing practice, so uh, maybe in a couple of weeks he can he can try it again. Well, uh, you know, we have a hundred and ninety one five star reviews. A hundred and ninety one. We need nine, Nate. We need nine. Nine until what, Josh? 200. That gets us 200. And for all the listeners, if y'all want to make it a safe 10, we can get 10 in, and then it's time to just uh, you know, pump the brakes. We need to pump the brakes there. Don't because listen to him. Give us 100 and, 125, or 225, rather, because then he has to go in with me. Yeah. And, and Ryan. Ryan will have to fish Josh out. Well, that's... That's no good. Uh, I'll make for great content, man. Come on. 10. Let's call it 10, 12 even. Uh, and okay, then, l- listeners, if you want quality video on your LinkedIn feeds next month, no, excuse me, in January, if you want, if you want quality, quality LinkedIn content in the new year, you must give us 225 five-star ratings and reviews. Once we get those, I promise you, we will get video audio pictures you you name it we'll we'll get it we might even get a vr video with the whole 360 thing on youtube so that you can see the full 360 degree experience of watching watching ryan ray and josh shelton go into lake granbury would that not be beautiful i think that would be beautiful uh that's a, that's a relative term well, look we we did get in several uh five star five star reviews over the last week, so I want to read a couple of those. Uh, big, big thanks to to those who gave us some written content. Um, first one is listening from Watford City, North Dakota. How many five star reviews for a Bakken Polar Plunge? That sounds cool. Nine. Nine. I Love- think he's talking about a polar plunge in the Bakken, though, or in, uh, up there in North Dakota, and that. Well, it's all the same. P- polar plunge. It's going to be pretty cold in January here. North right? Dakota's so. a heck of a lot colder than Texas in January. Agreed. Uh, we have another one that came in Tuesday. Love the content. So thank, thanks a lot. Uh, we'll prefer more news and less banter, but it's still good. I hear you. You know, uh, we mumble, we complain, and we do a little banter. So uh, I'll have to pass that note on to Ryan. You know, he's, he, he really needs to improve. <laughs> Good show. Love the content and the host's attitude. Thanks a lot for those reviews. Again, we're at 191. That, that guy's got a, got a French name, E.J. Benoit. So it looks like we've got some French listeners who, if you want to see skinny white guys go into the, go into the water, French people, give us 225 five-star reviews. Well, today we have a special guest coming on to assist me uh, co-hosting the show today. This is David Blackman. He's the editor of Shell Magazine and a Forbes contributor. David, it's been a while since we had you on, man. Glad to, glad to finally get you back. Yeah, I think uh, the last time I was on was uh, in September at some point. Uh, hadn't been that long, but it's been been too long. It's good to catch up. Yeah, well, I think that was probably when I was out, I imagine. So I was probably... Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so so going back, I haven't I haven't actually done a uh, done a show with you in quite some time, I believe. It's probably been at least six months. Yeah, yeah. Probably back to the one we did back in May, I guess. 
Well, uh, you released an article earlier this week uh, touching on Chesapeake's uh, long fight for survival. Um, there's been lots of news going out. I believe we were at that flaring conference and they were under a dollar, uh, their, their stock prices. And some news began to circulate, you know, about Jerry Jones, Comstock, looking at, at some of their Haynesville stuff. What can you tell us about this uh, Chesapeake situation? Um, you know, what, what can we expect? Do you think they're going to make it? Um, just kind of give us your thoughts on, on some of the things uh, involving Chesapeake. Well, you know, they're in a tough situation. Yeah, they were trading at 70 cents on Friday per share. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, they were over $2. Um, today, on Monday, they're trading at 65, so it's continued to fall. Uh, you know, I, I'm no kind of expert on whether or not they have the wherewithal to survive uh, without having to go through a Chapter 11 bankruptcy proceeding or some some other measure. Um, you know, the good news, they did have uh, just a sliver of good news last Wednesday when you know, Morgan Stanley said that they expected the management team there at Chesapeake to be able to manage through this crisis, um, but also talked about their need to take, quote, strategic actions in order to make that happen. And, and as you mentioned, one of the strategic actions that apparently is being considered is a sale of the company's remaining Haynesville shale assets to Comstock Resources, which is owned by Jerry Jones, a majority of which is owned by Jerry Jones, the Dallas Cowboys owner, who has a long, long history uh, in the oil and gas industry, an interesting side bit. Uh, I almost went to work for Jones's first oil company in 1984. Uh, which was called Arklatex, um, that he sold eventually after he bought the Dallas Cowboys. But that's that was how Jones made his first fortune. Fortune was in the oil and gas business. So, you know, that it's it's a tough situation. They've been struggling for a long, long time. Um, the piece I wrote at Forbes is you know kind of recaps some of the history of the company's you know uh, decision in the early part of this century. Uh, the early years to focus almost exclusively on natural gas as the energy resource of the future and one that would have a very high commodity price almost into perpetuity because it was thought to be this scarce resource. But then, you know, uh, the shale revolution happened and Chesapeake was a leader in that re revolution. And suddenly we had a, a glut of natural gas on the market from all these shale plays. And the price for natural gas plummeted as a consequence, you know, and, and the company had assumed a very high debt load to get into places like the Haynesville and the Barnett and the Marcellus Shale up in, in the Northeast. And so it kind of got caught short with, with a lot of debt and not enough uh, revenue. And then, you know, they had a change in strategy. They went from about 90% natural gas and 10% liquids in their portfolio you know, to investing in the Eagle Ford shale and the Utica shale up in Michigan. And, and within a couple of years, they were more like 50-50 liquids to natural gas because liquids prices were high. But it's still, they weren't able to generate enough free cash flow to service their debt uh, and stay in business, stay profitable. And so they had to engage in all these asset sales that they've done over the years. And so here they go again with another one, selling their Haynesville assets. Uh, the the Reuters story that that covered that said that they, you know they were considering selling the Haynesville assets in that, for an excess of a uh, billion dollars, which is a good chunk of change. But their debt load is nine point seven billion dollars for a company which, at their current stock price, has a market cap of about one point five billion. So it's a really difficult financial situation. It's a lot to work through. I, you know, I've had a lot of friends at Chesapeake over the years. Uh, they're all high quality individuals and the people I liked and respected. Uh, I wish them the best. I hope they are able to, to get through this because there are 2,500 jobs or so at stake in that company. And, um, you know, I don't ever want to see anybody out of work. It's, uh, tough deal so i wish them the best of luck yeah yeah that's you know some of my thoughts as well and you know, i saw there was a report that came out uh 
Texas oil industry is cutting payroll amid the slowdown. And, you know, I've been yeah. traveling around visiting uh, Midland, uh, Oklahoma, and it seems that the, that's, that's pretty – a pretty widespread uh, feel in the industry, especially on the, up, on the upstream side. It's it's pretty tough, and and for the vendors that sell to the upstream side, they're really struggling. Uh, a lot of them as well. So, um, pretty tough in the market. I was talking to my uncle. I have an uncle who runs a service company down in South Texas. Um, I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago. It's really really slowed down in Eagle Ford and, and other parts of South Texas. You know, there's just a lot of people being let go. Uh, in the service industry as well, and uh, you know, and it, it, with with current commodity price for oil and gas, there's not a lot of prospect for for that picking up anytime soon. Well, you know, there's in our. Fact, I, if you want to talk about prices for just a second, um, you know, it's it's really interesting. We've been in this paradigm with natural gas where where the price has been stuck in this two dollar and twenty cent to three dollar range for several years now and the, the product is so abundant there's not really in any upside in sight in, anywhere in the near future i'm afraid we're getting to that point with crude oil as well where the price may be stuck in this range of about 52 at the low end and 60 at the high end for west texas intermediate and no real prospect to break out above that uh, anytime soon. So it's just such an abundant resource now here in the U.S. and really globally that uh, it would take a real economic boom across the world uh, to, to change, to get out of that price range. Yeah, you know, and one of the things that I've, I've been wondering about, you know, we talked a little bit about the ducks and uh, – and also, uh, the, the even the rig count as it falls, the production still seems to be hanging in there. We're trying to understand better what is causing that. Is it the ducks, or is it just higher efficiencies and uh, and the overall production from these companies, from technology and and just yeah. Well, it's methods? it's it's a combination of both, but I think it's probably more attributable to the improvements in processes and technologies than it is to the ducks. Um, but the ducks certainly have a role in that. Mm. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, we've, we've had a 30% reduction in the rig count since last November when it peaked. Uh, and we're still increasing production uh, overall in the United States and even in the Permian Basin. Yep. So, and that's due to, you know, just companies getting better and better and better at what they do. And that's going to continue to be the case. It's always the case. Well, we know that we have an article that came out. Uh, this one is uh, with the Chronicle. Big oil majors looking to sell $27 billion in assets worldwide. So some of the big players here, Exxon, Chevron, BP, uh, they are trying to focus more on some of their core assets. Exxon especially is really focusing on yeah. their Permian Basin assets. We've got um, – I've gotten, you know, verbal uh, – cues from folks that they're really up in their production next year uh rigs are supposed to yeah. soar uh but it, they're they're getting rid of let's see they are supposed to be trying to sell uh several uh assets you know that are in between four to ten billion um in in different areas so that they can focus more uh let's see it's 15 billion yeah. assets by 2021 is what they're planning to get rid of it includes uh norwegian norwegian north sea assets for 4.5 billion so uh, Chevron, I haven't seen them do much um, in the Permian. I'm, I'm really expecting them to, uh, to make a move. Have you have any ideas on if, if they're targeting any specific companies? Well, I don't. Uh, you know, you hear rumors all the time, but uh, I don't have any insider knowledge of any mergers or acquisitions that are in the works. I, I anticipate some of those happening. Um, but a company, for example, you know, Chevron, you just asked about. Chevron uh, did recently announce plans to, just like Exxon, really increase their level of, of drilling and capital spend in the Permian Basin next year. And, you know, uh, Exxon Mobil's doing the same thing. They have had, you know, Exxon not only has the Permian to focus on, but they have the Guyana. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, huge. It's uh, the biggest uh, offshore global offshore oil find in the last several years off of this tiny little country next door to Venezuela that has less than 700,000 people living in it. Yeah. 
going to completely change the standard of living for, for everyone in that country if it's managed properly by the government. Hopefully it will be. Um, and then they also have had the biggest uh, natural gas find uh, discovery here in, in recent years uh, in the Mediterranean off of Cyprus. And so, you know, they, they have these new core areas to, to focus on, and it's a, a natural progression for a company like that to divest non-core assets. Same thing BP's doing. I mean, BP, you know, sold their remaining Prudhoe Bay assets to Hillcorp. Hopefully that sale will be completed soon, um, you know, so that they can focus more of their capital on uh, the big uh, BHP acquisition they did last year, uh, $12 billion acquisition of BHP shale assets in the United States. And, um, you know, so all these majors, uh, they go through this constantly, this, uh, you know, rationalizing of their asset portfolio to, to divest non-core properties. And, uh, there's a lot of it going on right now. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think that they'll also be looking obviously to, to pick up more assets there in the Permian. And there's a lot of companies, independent producers who you would think might be pretty good targets for, for companies like that to look at. It would, it would seem, uh, for sure. Uh, you know, I, uh, one of the, one of the big questions about, the uh, upcoming year is going to be, you know, OPEC, um, you know, what, what they plan to do. I saw, uh, Saudi Aramco's initial IPO valuation came in at 1.7 trillion. I don't know if that's <laughs> a official number, uh, because a lot of the reports I was looking at earlier last week were showing it the more likely to be around the 1.2, um, the 1.2 yeah. trillion area. It depends of course on your, what your outlook is for, for valuation of, of the product. Um, you know, they were hoping, I think, for $2 trillion valuation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're going to come up short of that due to, you know, and they can't control the price. They've tried. They, uh, this is what the whole OPEC plus alignment with Russia and Mexico was all about, uh, trying to get the Brent price up to around between 70 and 75, which would put WTI around 65. And, uh, you know, they've come up short of that in large part because uh, production here in the United States has grown by 3 million barrels a day over the last two years and continues to grow. And so it just with the economy, the global economy not booming, you know, it's not in recession, but it is, has slowed down significantly since the trade war began with China. And, and so, you know, part of that outlook uh, for, for Saudi Arabia and Saudi Aramco is, is whether or not the United States and China get past this trade war. Just like part of the outlook for domestic companies here in the United States is, you know, hoping for relief from these tariffs on steel and aluminum and, and other tariffs that are a part of that. And there have been optimistic signs over the last few weeks. It's the big reason why the stock market has boomed so uh, dramatically here in the United States. And, and hopefully at least an interim deal uh, will get done here before the end of the year. There's supposed to be a signing ceremony uh, right after Thanksgiving uh, at one of the global summit meetings. I can't remember which one this is. And so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see if that gets done. If it does, that'll have a, a pretty strong impact uh, on the global economy and demand for the product. Well, uh, speaking of some of the Permian things, there was an article that came out. Uh, Ryan and I discussed it briefly last week. Uh, Sergio Chapa uh, wrote an article that bandwidth is uh, poised to become the next bottleneck in the Permian Basin. So he's talking about uh, cellular data, how uh, there, a lot of them are moving to 5G. And right now, one of the big problems that they have out there is there's just not a lot of cell towers, and there's not uh, the infrastructure on the cellular side to keep up with the technology that they're wanting to implement out in the Permian. So uh, yeah. fascinating stuff, really. It really is. It's such an amazing story to me. I, you know, uh, I've been in this industry 40 years now and, uh, you know, you're used to seeing stories about there being a shortage of pipeline capacity or shortage of frac sand, shortage of qualified employees to work the crews and, a shortage of truck drivers, all these different kinds of bottlenecks that can take place. But, but to be talking about bandwidth being, uh, 
a, a, a looming big bottleneck out there is kind of amazing. But it just shows, you know, how rapidly these companies uh, are are adopting these new technologies, machine learning and and remote control technologies. Um, my gosh, I was in Apache's uh, San Antonio offices late last year to do an interview there with with one of their uh, VPs and uh, he showed me how they're using drones, you know, from their San Antonio office to monitor pretty much every operation out there in the Permian Basin hmm. and how they remotely control their production and, and can shut in wells remotely and let contractors through gate, you know, location gates remotely. Um, and all that requires bandwidth. And uh, yeah, those are wide open spaces out there and the towers are, are spaced pretty far apart. So uh, it doesn't surprise me, I guess, that this is happening. And I'm sure that Verizon and AT&T and the other carriers will respond quickly because these are giant customers we're talking about here, a lot of revenue to those companies. And I wonder, uh, you know, another report came out. I wonder how, uh, so th this report says that the Permian production is going to plateau in 2021. I wonder how that impacts the planned um, investment into some of that infrastructure. Uh, I know that the 5G stuff is going to be fairly expensive. Um, yeah. Will that plateau affect how some of these people are, are viewing the, the upside on the investment or – do you think just the overall size and immensity of the Permian is enough, even if it does plateau, to still warrant that kind of investment from the from the cellular side? You know, thinking about the yeah. Well, I think you know what that yeah, and it's an IHS market study was the one I saw, uh, which is you know one of the one of the smartest groups out there that that does these kinds of studies related to oil and gas. So it's got a lot of credibility. Um, but, but what they're saying, of course, is that the, the Permian overall production will peak in 2021. But, the, but what they're not saying is that it's going to go into any sort of bust after that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the anticipation is there's going to be a high level of drilling and production and development activity out in the Permian Basin for, for a couple of decades to come as that field is fully developed. You know, there are nine different shale formations uh, producing zones that, that need to be fully uh, uh, developed. And that's going to take a lot of years to do. So I, I, I don't think that'll be a limiter on, on, you know, what, what the cellular companies are willing to do out there. I think the big question is, you know, how quickly can they get it done and what kind of uh, impacts does it has have on the industry and just in terms of slowing down their ability to to build out their infrastructure mm. uh and and employ those new technologies but it's you know it's uh it's always a balancing act for for everybody who's uh, and you know the other thing just just talking about this specific subject show is how the industry's capital investment and spending reverberates through the whole economy you know, anywhere the industry is present, every capital dollar the industry spends produces three to four dollars in, in additional economic impact through the economy, uh, even, you know, in, um, among cellular carriers. Um, so it just it's an amazing business and uh, it'll still be healthy after 2021. But I guess, yeah, you know, because of the lower commodity price now, people are anticipating uh, a, a peak coming sooner rather than later. Well, there's another uh, big company that I have some uh, some information on. So we've we've been talking a little bit about Oxy. Uh, they did a JV with Echo Petrol a, a month or two ago. Uh, the the news came out at least at least a, I think it was actually a couple months ago. I thought the deal was done. Uh, a report came out this week. I say this week, last week, uh, that shows that that was just finalized. So Echo Petrol acquired a 49 percent stake in Rodeo Midland Basin which is owned 51% uh, by, by Oxy. So it was a $1.5 billion deal where Echo Petrol was paying in to get a stake in that Rodeo Midland Basin, and, um, and they were going to come in and, and do some drilling on the Midland side of the Permian assets that were acquired in the Anadarko deal. So uh, yeah. interesting stuff there that, um, that that deal finally closed, and there's – 
a couple of other things that came out. I don't know if you saw this, David, but uh, Oxy has about $15 billion in assets that they're wanting to sell by mid-2020. That includes yeah. like an $8 billion estimated $8 billion uh, pipeline that they're, they're looking to, uh, to get rid of uh, or to sell and divest. And several mm-hmm. other several other uh, huge assets that they're looking to to divulge. Yeah, they're international stuff, right? Yeah, the the LNG export facility over there in in, in Africa, and then then they also have uh, Anadarko's production from Algeria. Uh, that Total is looking at acquiring both of those, mm-hmm. um, but that was like what? Just those two assets were like ten billion dollars yep. of that, something like that. And that's all, you know, to raise to, to help raise uh, the the money to to repay the debt they assumed in acquiring Anadarko. That's right. Um, and they, and they, you know, to Oxy's credit, they made all that uh, known that that would be their plan when they did that acquisition in there. You know, that was just four months, or five months ago, and uh, you know they're already executing on it. So that's pretty. Pretty rapid timing on that uh, vestiture. Yeah, the specific name there is uh, Oxy Stake in Western Midstream, a pipeline system it inherited in the Anadarko's takeover that has a market value yeah. of eight point seven billion. So, uh, wow. yeah, so <laughs> that's a uh, pretty impressive stuff there. So, I you know there was the, I had never even heard of that. I knew about the African assets that they were wanting to divulge to Total. That was really in the initial reports that that was coming out i didn't hear anything about the western midstreams i wasn't even aware that anadarko had um stake in that so uh yeah you know uh, all the news uh, most of the news reporting around that acquisition focused on anadarko's permian assets which was what made it such an attractive takeover target for oxy but you know anadarko also the biggest producer uh, in the dj basin in colorado and I think that's where most of those gathering assets, midstream assets were, were mm. uh, focused. And, um, you know, so Oxy is also the biggest producer up there in Colorado now, in, in addition to having such an expanded presence in, in the Permian Basin. So uh, there was a lot more to that Anadarko, you know, the company and that, that uh, acquisition than just the Permian assets. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, Curious to see, you know how how I know they have that big uh, loan that they received with uh, from Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm curious yeah. to see um, how all that plays out if, if they'll go in and try to pay that off, you know, quickly quickly. Or I, I'm not even sure the terms that are that are in that agreement of how. Um, I, I do know that it's pretty steep. Uh, I forget the interest rate. Was it like eight uh, percent or something like that? I, I don't remember. Yeah, it was. It was above. It was above the prime lending rate. Let's, yeah. yeah, put it that. Way. Right, right. Yeah. So but, you know, just short, short intended to be a short term deal to to uh, to bridge them over uh, to these asset sales, and, and so that'll get paid back. That may be among the first things they they pay back. You would think. Well, an- another article came out. Oryx Midstream is buying Targa's Permian assets. So this this article came out. Let's see. This was November the fourteenth, and uh, just days after Targa Resources announced plans to sell its Permian-based crude oil gathering network, um, mm-hmm. uh, Oryx came in and paid one hundred and thirty-five million for the assets. It's expected to close next month. So interesting to see Oryx, uh, a company that's been growing in the Permian. Uh, going in and acquiring some of Targa's um, assets there. Yeah, you know, Oryx uh, has been an interesting company that that has evolved so much over the years. Um, Oryx was actually their their uh, production assets uh, were bought by Anadarko back 20 years ago. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's amazing the his history of all of this. I had some good friends who who were at Oryx who ended up going over to Anadarko as a part of that deal. Um, but it's just you know part of the constant churning of assets in in this industry, and it's, it's it gets to be kind of hard to keep up with who's buying whom and who's buying what assets. And you know, uh, gosh, ten years ago when you when you looked at the big players, for example, in the Haynesville shale, uh, ten years ago you were talking about companies like Encana and, and Chesapeake and you know, a handful of others that are, you know, either not there anymore or, or about to, to sell out. And, uh, you know, we've seen a similar churning of assets in, in the, in the 
Barnett Shale up here in North Texas. And uh, it's just this never ending process that goes on in this business. It is. I mean, and then you have all the changes that are going to be coming from uh, some of the environmental factors, um, forcing some of these companies to change what they're doing. Uh, so I, I mentioned I was at that uh, flaring conference uh, in Midland this past week, and uh, and they were talking about, um, I think, you know, the comments that were made about flaring companies having X amount of days to flare before they're going to be uh, flagged and there's going to be fines that's going to be um, levied against these companies. Also, if mm -hmm. if there's pipeline capacity that's available, even if they have to move it at a loss, that the option to flare is going to begin to be removed. So uh, these companies are, are really scrambling around trying to figure out what to do with the, with the natural gas uh, in order to avoid some of these fines. And so there were all sorts of companies that were there given solutions that they, that they had. Um, you have, yeah. you have Baker Hughes that, are, that created the natural gas turbine that is going to be powered by natural gas, generate electricity, which will then power the frack fleets that, that are, um, operating and, and producing there. Uh, supposedly, uh, the numbers that they had was it will save about 800 million per month in, um, not 800 million, uh, 800,000 per month in, uh, fuel costs. Uh, about a yeah. million, about a million a month in in fuel cost. Um, then there was uh, a company there that had some multi phase pumps that were used in other places in the country and offshore. And basically, these pumps pull in oil, gas, water all all together, run them through a pipeline from site all the way to uh, the Gulf Coast. Obviously, there may be gathering lines all linking up to one big line, but essentially, you don't separate out the fluids. And, uh, and uh, until they get to a differentiator uh, in uh, somewhere near the coast uh, where they actually yeah. going to separate out these products, which is interesting uh, because that hasn't been used in the Permian at all. And I'm not sure if there's a reason for that, um, but it's certainly interesting. Well, I it's more efficient. Um, I mean, there's a reason why you, you build uh, pipelines that uh, transport only crude oil and pipelines that transport only natural gas. It's uh, it's easier on the pipe itself in terms of uh, withstanding the pressures and, and the, any kind of corrosion uh, from the contents of a lot of these uh, streams at the wellhead have not just not only oil and natural gas, they have a, a, a content of sulfur, uh, they have a content of carbon dioxide and uh, that you know it's a lot more efficient to remove those things before they go into a pipeline in mm -hmm. terms of uh, overall maintenance costs over the life of the line so that's why they do it that way um but yeah you know so, so here's what ir i think is finally irritating the railroad commission the commissioners regulators and 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 others of, about this flaring issue and that is that a lot of these technologies have existed for many years and have been available for many years, uh, going all the way back to, to the last century, frankly. And uh, yet this flaring issue has become a major PR nightmare for this industry in every shale play in the United States of America. And the industry has failed for 20 years to produce any sort of proactive industry-wide solution to that issue. And so we had Wayne Christian just a few weeks ago, the chairman of the Texas Railroad Commission at a public hearing, telling the industry and warning the industry that, that the commission, frank, frankly, is getting tired of issuing these never-ending extensions to flaring permits. They had just voted two to one to issue an extension to a company that wanted an extension to their flaring permit, even though they had a natural gas pipeline hook up for the well they were asking for the extension on because they didn't want to put the, the gas in the sales line because the price was too low. Well, at some point, you know, the regulators get tired of taking the heat for issuing those kinds of extensions and, and taking the heat on behalf of the industry, frankly, uh, for the flaring issue that continues to go on. I mean, we still have, have, you know, too much flaring in the Eagle Ford shale happening. Um, and, and the industry, it, it's just gotten to the point where everyone's patience 
with this issue just lingering out there and, and the industry using the same talking points it's used for 20 years that, oh gosh, as soon as we have a pipeline system, it's all going to go away. Well, when you're asking for a permit extension on a well that, that has a hookup to a pipeline, I'm sorry, it's not going away. And I think that that you know, that was when the regulators kind of finally said, okay, enough of this. And uh, it's it's a big problem, not just in West Texas. It's a, a remaining big issue out in the Bakken Shale in North Dakota. Uh, they dealt with it uh, up in Colorado because the regulators up there really got after them and forced it. And so I guess that's what's going to end up happening here in Texas, too. And uh, it's too bad it had to come to that because these technologies have been available for quite some time. Well, one of the technologies that uh, that was mentioned there, so we've we've talked a lot about uh, Bitcoin mining machines that they've been using natural gas to do. This guy had this guy brought in some yeah. uh, some photos of Bitcoin farms in Canada. They were just enormous uh, locations where there would be, I mean, just countless uh, Bitcoin mining machines. Right, and the profit margins that they were turning were so enormous that uh, that basically he said at this particular point, um, smaller players going in and investing say a million dollars in a Bitcoin farm would would be worthless at this point. Now the the players have become so big that um, that you would need to be ten million plus before it would be uh, an investment that would be worthwhile. He said. Uh, another thing was that these EMP uh, owners are going to be some of the biggest Bitcoin mining uh, owners in the world uh, within the next couple yeah. of years because um, it's such a profitable thing that uh, these EMP companies are have this specific need, uh, commodity like natural gas that they can use to to do um, this mining. So very interesting stuff there. Uh, hearing how. You know, I had my doubts about this, so I, I, I didn't, I wasn't too keen on um, advising people to invest their money into it. But it seems that it right. has really um, turned a corner and has taken off. Well, I hope it does for them. I've been aware of that concept for about ten months now, uh, and made some introductions on behalf of one company that's trying to to sell that concept. You know, it's a tough sell inside of a company that uh, is run by petroleum engineers and, and other geoscientists who don't really, you know, it, it, it's such a, a, a different kind of concept for the oil and gas industry that it's, it's difficult for, for these vendors of this technology to sell in a single meeting. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, it seems to work. There have been test cases now. Um, you know, I hope it does get some pretty broad distribution uh, because it's one of and one of the issues with adopting these technologies to to relieve the flaring is that you know it's had a negative impact on the bottom line. That, that companies who are under a great deal of pressure from investors to maximize returns. And um, if you do have a concept, if this you know Bitcoin mining concept can really be proven to actually improve the company's bottom line, then it's going to really uh, probably take off because all the other concepts that I've seen end up, you know, costing more money than they generate. So uh, it, it's, it's very interesting, but like I say, internally at these, these upstream companies, it's, it's a really hard sale. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of one of the guys that was there that was sitting at uh, my table, a uh, brilliant guy. I'm not going to use his name, but he asked the guy about data centers, um, and he said, uh, "Have you looked into those?" And the, and the the speaker there uh, acknowledged that he had, and that he was actually transitioning to data centers from Bitcoin at the time because um, because of the amount of risk is much lower on the data centers and they're more, I guess, able to scale at, at, a, at a level that is more difficult with the Bitcoin. So um, it seems, it seems that, that yeah. So <laughs> the, the data centers are going to be trying to utilize the natural gas as well to, to power these, these areas. Um, and from what I understand, more and more data centers are needed, especially 
um, especially if what I understand about the blockchain um, is is correct. These data centers are going to be necessary um, at, at some point. So definitely some interesting things developing with uh, with technology uh, in the in the oil and gas sector. Oh yeah. It's well, just fascinating. All the machine learning stuff that, that's going on really is is amazing how much money, you know, uh, an application, a machine learning application that allows you to actually predict when equipment is going to break down and proactively address it before any kind of interruptions take place. The, the impacts, the positive impacts on the bottom line are amazing. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. We have one more article, uh, David, to hit before we wrap things up today. So uh, there was an article that came out. This is just kind of a roundup article. Oil and gas wastewater companies merge amid Permian Basin boom. So uh, a company, (laughs) Gravity Energy, uh, says it is acquiring on-point oil field holdings from White Deer Energy. And it says that... uh, the deal would establish the largest commercial produced water injection operation in the Midland Basin on the Texas side of the Permian. So yeah. uh, it's supposed That's to be a big operation. Big, yeah. 17 saltwater disposal wells, 432,000 barrels per day of permitted capacity to gravity's existing water midstream business. So um, water has been one of the big topics. Every time I'm out in Midland, uh, water is, is always a hot topic. So um, I imagine this would be a, a great investment for, for these companies and hopefully yeah. uh, provide some, um, some needed water for, for these uh, producers out in West Texas and uh, New Mexico. You know what's so fascinating to me about West Texas is that the supply of water is not the issue. Now that, now that we can use uh, briny water in, in frack jobs, there, there's actually no shortage of supply. Um, when you can use brackish water, the, the 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 supply of brackish water in West Texas is almost inexhaustible. It's hundreds of trillions of, of barrels of water out there that can never be used up, basically. Um, but but yeah, figuring out what to do with the water after it's been used in all fill operations that's the big issue uh, out there, and it's going to continue to be the big issue. The more that they can recycle rather than, you know, and use in, a, in subsequent frack jobs or even for livestock purposes, because a lot of it gets cleaned up to the point that it's really potable water. Um, the more you can use for other purposes rather than just re-inject down a hole uh, into these formations, uh, very deep formations that they use, uh, the better off they're going to be because, you know, eventually those formations do get filled up. That's an ongoing issue out in East Texas. Northeast Texas is one of the main formations that have been used for, for uh, wastewater disposal has, has basically become over overfilled. And, and so, and, and also when you, the more you fill these formations, the more pressure they put on the rock and can tend to produce seismic activity, which of course has been another industry or uh, issue that's kind of plagued the industry in recent mm. years but, but but yeah you know it's a big business out there in west texas and it's going to continue to be for a long time to come it's, it's interesting you missed the uh, you mentioned the um the water uh recycling there was actually someone there that was uh talking with baker hughes basically these natural gas turbines uh, almost run like a jet engine, so they produce a ton of heat that have to, mm-hmm. basically they have to put a box over it and, and contain some of the heat. Well, this guy actually had some um, uh, technology, it's been around for a while, but basically you use the heat and you use that to uh, purify and distill the water. So you're yeah. able to, to take advantage of the heat produced by these turbines and cut cost even further uh, for these companies so that will help maybe improve that bottom line even a bit more. So, And he mentioned that they may even sell the water back to the farmers, like you mentioned, uh, or right. reuse it in the frack job. You know, and, and it's such a difficult process to do that. Uh, the EPA, uh, it's, it's easier to do it on, on, you know, most of the Permian Basin is private land holding. So it's a lot easier to do that on private land holdings than, 20 years ago, the company I worked for was the biggest producer in the San Juan Basin up, up in northeast New Mexico, or northwest New Mexico. And 
the water that was coming up out of the hole was potable water. It was clean without even being processed. Uh, human beings could safely drink it. And yet we couldn't get a permit from the EPA to give the water to, to uh, farmers and ranchers who really needed it for their livestock and their crops because the EPA simply would not issue the permit. And an awful, I mean, billions of, of gallons of water got just sent right back down the hole for no real need uh, because it was impossible to get a permit out of, out of the Environmental Protection Agency to do that. It was kind of sad, but luckily EPA doesn't really have purview over these private lands and, and hopefully uh, that won't become an issue with, with the state agencies here in Texas. Well, David, I think uh, I think that wraps us up, man. I think that uh, we got to talk about quite a few things today. So, uh, well, yeah, this has been a wide ranging discussion, as they say. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, lots of, you know, nothing huge in the news this week, but lots of lots of little things to, I think, are definitely pertinent and interesting um, to discuss. So. Great having you on, David. I uh, hopefully we can get you back home. Maybe when one day when Ryan's here, we can uh, run through some some different industry related topics. Well, there's never a shortage of things to talk about. Awesome. Well, David, uh, appreciate your time today, man. Have a good one. Yeah. Thanks. You too. Uh, big thanks to David Blackman uh, coming on to help me host the show today. Um, Really interesting insights. Uh, I always love having David uh, come on and, and share. He's been in the industry for a long time and always has some unique uh, things to contribute. So hopefully, uh, hopefully Ryan's ovaries clear up. Um, I know I know that's been a, a tough bout here for the last few days. And Lord willing, he'll he'll be able to get some fishing lessons here here before the end of the year. Uh, maybe he can have some better success next year. With that, um, I think that uh, wraps us up for today. So appreciate y'all tuning in. Five-star reviews. Don't forget. Thanks a lot for those who have already sent those in. And until next time, keep climbing.